Last May, I was fortunate enough to propose to my partner with a diamond ring. And I'm going to take you on a journey now of how that diamond got from the interior of the earth to the surface where it could be made into that ring. Now, my PhD research focuses on kimberlites, and they're a type of volcano. It's not a typical volcano. It's not one that you might have seen in Japan or in Hawaii, for example. There's no nice cone shape or nice mountain that you can climb up. They actually form giant holes in the ground or craters. And that's because the magma comes to the surface so quickly that it actually causes an explosion rather than growing this nice big mountain or peak. Now, there's three key reasons why kimberlites are important. The first is that kimberlites are the primary host rocks to diamonds. And here we have an example. This is from a kimberlite from Botswana. It's a couple of hundred grams and it's sold for almost 70 million Australian dollars. The second key reason is that kimberlites are the deepest derived magmas on Earth. We believe they come from depths anywhere between 200 to 600 kilometers directly beneath our feet. Now that's the kind of distance you could get from Melbourne to Canberra, for example. The third reason is that kimberlites transport pieces of a deep mantle to the Earth's surface. And actually, I have one here in my hand. This has come from several hundred kilometers straight down to the surface in a kimberlite. Now these last two points, the deep derivation and the fact they can actually transport things from the Earth's interior to our surface are particularly important. Now Hollywood, that'd make you believe that humans can get into a machine and access the interior of the Earth, maybe even the core. But in reality, the deepest hole that humans have dug is only 12 kilometers deep. Now on the scale of the Earth, that's really only scratching the surface, the outer skin, the upper crust. And that's why kimberlites are super important. They're like our conduit or our plumbing system that allows us to tap into the deep earth directly. They can bring up pieces of the mantle for us to study, but also allow us to understand how the interior of the earth has evolved with time. But despite this obvious scientific and even economic importance, if you consider diamonds, for example, kimberlites still remain enigmatic. We don't yet fully understand the where, the when, the how, or the why. So where do they come from? When do they erupt in Earth's history? How do they evolve? Why do they only occur in certain parts of the world? All of these questions are what drove me to choose kimberlites as my PhD research topic. Now, in particular, I looked at Finland, and two kimberlite occurrences are in Finland. There's a Kusamo cluster in the northeast, or the Kavi Kuopio field in the southeast. Now, the first thing I wanted to tackle was understanding their magmatic history. How did these things evolve? From their source region, when they were molten and hot, when they came to the surface, they cooled down and crystallized into solid rock. To understand how that happened, we take our kimberlite, here's a kimberlite here, and we polish it down until it's a few millionths of a meter thick. And that allows us to pass light through the rock and put it under a microscope. That's important because we can look at the minerals, the textures, textures, understand how things grew together. Taking that a step further, we take that same thin piece of rock and put it under a scanning electron microscope. And then we hit it with electrons. That's important because we can look at the rock under more detail. And you can see with that scale bar in the bottom right hand image, we're looking at things that are 0.05 millimeters across. And those blacks and grays in these pictures actually tell us something about the differences in chemistry of those materials, or those minerals. To understand their exact composition, we use an electron microprobe, again hitting our rock with electrons. But this actually allows us to work out the exact composition. How much iron is there? How much aluminium? How much chromium? for example, all of these things are important. And if we combine that chemical information with the textures of the rock, I can work out that these two kimberlite occurrences have had a distinct magmatic evolution. When they left their source region, when they were molten hot rocks and got to the surface, there was a different process for each of these occurrences that happened in a different way. Now, understanding the magmatic source, this is important for me because I want to know where they've come from inside the earth. What is the chemical signature of that source? To do that, we use chemistry again. And here's a picture of strontium from a periodic table. And you can see that the mass number isn't a whole number. That's because all elements have isotopes. An isotope is the same element, but with a different mass. And I care about the ratio of those isotopes because it tells me a lot about the source signature, its chemical flavor, if you will. Now, to work out this process, the isotopic signature, we take a rock and we crush it into powder, or we crush it and separate tiny crystals. Once we've done that, we have our crystals or our powder, we go into a clean lab, we put on a nice suit. Now the clean lab's important because it rules out any external factors that might contaminate our sample. From here, we take our rock or our crystals and we treat it with some acid, very strong acid. We use a hot plate or we use a steel jacket called a bomb. These bombs are important because with these, I can heat up the rock under high pressure and high temperature. This is important because it's the kind of thing you need if you want to dissolve a rock from solid rock into a solution. 
Once we have that solution, we put it over some columns. And you can think of these columns a bit like a sieve. Everything is going to fall through that sieve, apart from the one element, the one thing that we care about. Now, once we have that one thing or that one element we care about in a solution, and I show it to a torch, that torch makes a plasma that's 10,000 degrees or twice as hot as the sun. And what that does is basically blow up my solution. The solution is now separated into individual tiny atoms. And those tiny atoms can be measured on what we call a mass spectrometer. And from here, I can calculate the exact ratio of the isotopes that I care about. For example, hafnium, neodymium, and strontium. Looking at some results now, here's a hafnium versus neodymium isotope plot. And those different shades of red are a database of global kimberlite source signatures. That dark red patch is the most common global kimberlite source signature. And my Kusumo samples are perfect. They're well behaved, they overlie that perfect expected signature. But the Carby Quopio kimberlites, however, are distinct. And what this can tell us is that the Carby Quopio kimberlites and the Kusumo kimberlites have distinct deep mental source regions. They've actually tapped different chemical domains of the deep earth, they have their own chemical flavor. The next step was to work out the when. When were these kimberlites in place? When did they erupt to the surface? Again, we go through the same process as before, but we're looking at different elements now. Now we care about radioactive decay. That's like our geological stopwatch or timer. So we know how long it takes to decay from one isotope of uranium to one isotope of lead. And we can use that as our stopwatch, our measure of how long ago it was that these things were in place. We can also use the potassium argon system and the rubidium strontium system. Now I'm using three different systems here because I want to be really sure. I want to, I want to know that I have the right age for when these things were in place. And from all this work, from looking at this radioactive decay, I can work out that the Kusumo kimblites were in place at 750 million years ago in the Earth's past. The Carby Quopio kimblites, however, were in place more recently at 600 million years ago. Now I have the ages. I know when they were in place, but why? What was happening in Earth's history to promote this activity? If we look at a snapshot of Earth's history at 770 million years ago, all of the continents were grouped together. This is called a supercontinent. It actually had a name, Rodinia. I'm going to play an animation now, and the plates are going to move apart. And by 742 million years ago, the Kusumo kimberlites were in place, shown there with those blue dots. Going forward even further, the plates are now drifting further and further and further apart. And as those plates drift apart, and as we approach around 600 million years ago, we're going to see the next kimberlites are in place, and there they are. That's the Carby Corpio kimberlites. Now we can also see that these two occurrences are near this red line. Now, this red line is actually the border of an important province. These provinces lie down in the deep earth. They're not anomalous. Thousands of kilometers at the core mantle boundary, these provinces are actually the home of mantle plumes. Now, mantle plumes are hot energetic upwellings from the deep earth, from those provinces. And we believe that these provinces are actually the, the cause and their plumes are the cause of why supercontinents break up. These plumes come to the surface with so much force and energy, they can actually break the continents apart. And my theory is that the same hot upwelling that's causing this continents to break apart are also the reason that we have kimberlite eruptions at these times in Earth's history. So concluding all that, all that work, we had two kimberlite occurrences in Finland. I was able to show that they have a distinct magmatic evolution from their source region to the surface, from when they were hot magma to when they cooled down a solid rock. The next thing I was able to show with isotopes that they have a distinct deep mantle source. They have tapped different domains of the Earth's interior with their own chemical flavor. I was also able to look at the when. These kimberlites were in place around 750 and 600 million years ago in Earth's history. The why? Well, they were in place when the supercontinent started to break up. And that supercontinent broke up because we had these hot mental upwellings from deep inside the Earth. Thank you for listening. And by the way, she said yes.